If somebody told you there's a party in the park tonight and you should bring your toothbrush, what would you think? Somebody's throwing an elaborate outdoor slumber party? Maybe there's a citywide fundraiser to promote dental hygiene. What if I told you that it was actually code to signal the beginning of one of the largest, most successful nonviolent protests in American history? And now, what if I told you that the people protesting were as young as four and no older than 18. On Thursday, May 2nd, 1963, the Children's March began in Birmingham, Alabama. At the time, Birmingham had a nickname. It was called Bombingham, as there had been 60 unsolved bombings of black schools, churches, homes, and businesses, and not a single arrest made for any of them. The black children of Birmingham grew up witnessing and suffering immense violence at the hands of the Ku Klux Klan, the police force, and members of the white community. As the civil rights movement picked up steam, Martin Luther King Jr. decided the only way to create real change in the city was to flood the jails. When he called for volunteers to risk arrest, however, only the children of Birmingham heeded his call. MLK and other movement leaders were extremely worried for the children's safety and almost didn't let them protest at all. But no amount of fear could stop the thousands of young people that were ready to hit the streets to make real change in Birmingham and across the nation. On May 2nd, radio DJs announced the Party in the Park, code for the protest, and told kids to bring their toothbrushes, as most would be held overnight, if not for several days, in jail. They signaled the movement with songs as well, such as Chuck Berry's School Days. Music was extremely important to the civil rights movement and specifically to the Children's March. As thousands of black students walked out of school and gathered at the 16th Street Baptist Church, they built excitement, bravery, and friendship by singing. And they kept singing as they marched through the streets of Birmingham. Organizers sent them out from the church in waves of 50. Police would arrest 50 children and believe that the protest was over, only to be hit by another 50 kids immediately after. Then another, then another, a thousand children were arrested on the first day. The demonstrations continued for a week, and as time wore on, the police commissioner, Bull Connor, notorious for his violent treatment of black people and protesters, got tougher. He called for fire hoses and dogs to be used on children as young as four. The jails got fuller, and as more and more young people were arrested, they packed into cells that also housed rats and bugs. But nothing could stop the resistance and persistence of these students and children. When when Bull Connor called for fire hoses, despite the harsh pain of the water, despite him, children came in their swimsuits. When they were finally released from jail, they went right back to protest. Children outside of Birmingham would walk as far as 18 miles to be a part of the movement. They kept marching, and they kept singing. In jail, they would sing together. When they were hosed, they would sing together. Through it all, they lifted their voices in the fight for safety, justice, and equity. After a week of demonstrations, the jails had been filled several times over, and the police force knew that they couldn't stop the movement. The people weren't afraid of them anymore, and all of their power was dependent on the community's fear. Several days of negotiations between movement leaders and white officials ended with the integration of Birmingham and the removal of Bull Connor from the police force. The president, John F. Kennedy, gave the first national address in support of integration and began work on the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which would outlaw segregation and employment discrimination. There was still much violence that followed. Changing the law and changing people's minds and larger systems of oppression does not occur all at once. The Ku Klux Klan would later bomb the 16th Street Baptist Church, killing four young black girls. 
Birmingham would still be rampant with racist acts and hate crimes in the midst of legal integration. But despite the difficult path of progress and all the violence they risked along the way, the children of Birmingham won. The children won. There are many movement leaders that played a part, but the real change was made by thousands of young people willing to risk everything in pursuit of a better world. We may not know all of their individual names, but we know their bravery and we know their power. They deserve our celebration. And so, to celebrate these thousands of brave young people, we at the Atlanta History Center propose that, just as the children did, we raise our voices. Singing reminds us of the power we have individually to make noise and change, and the power we have as a group to increase our volume and presence in numbers. Everyone can sing or make music in their own way, regardless of their age or ability, just as everyone has a place and responsibility in the fight for justice. So choose a song. Click on one of the links below to see a member of the Atlanta History Center singing or playing a song used in the Children's March. Some are radio hits used by DJs to communicate with students. Some are revamped versions of Black spirituals that were rewritten to support the movement. Share your song on social media with the hashtag MakeHistory, and the Atlanta History Center will share your version to add to our chorus. History belongs to all of us, which means all of us can choose to make celebrate or change the course of history every day. Keep on a walking, yeah, yeah. Keep on a talking, yeah. yeah. Marching after freedom.